So as uh, everybody's coming in, getting settled, you might notice that the, um, the title on the screen does not match what's in your program. I'll explain that. You're probably in the right room. <laughs> but it's really your choice if you want to hear me talk about one topic or the other. If, you, if you're really married to the other topic and you, you don't want to hear about business models and Drupal products and open source and Drupal 8 and how that can, can accelerate your business models, then you should leave now really fast. Um, right, so we may as well begin. It's about time. Thank you for coming. My name is Robert Douglas. I'm the director of products for Commerce Guys. And when, um, when, when my uh, CMO asked me for a, a session title and description for DrupalCon, I thought it would be really cool to talk about all of the different ways that uh, your business can do commerce that isn't necessarily having a product catalog and shipping things in the mail. That's still probably a really great idea, but in the meantime, I had a different idea, <laughs> and that's actually what I decided to force upon you today. So let me give you the spiel so you can evaluate whether you, you really want to be here or not. So um, I have a vision for uh, Drupal and for particularly agencies uh, or the so-called Drupal shop who do sites, how they could make a leap into a more product-oriented business model. And I call that open source as a service, or a hybrid SaaS. And I want to give you the recipe that I have in my mind for actually doing that type of hybrid SaaS. And I've got a couple case studies along the way. Um, and we're going to talk about Drupal 8. We're going to talk about uh, recurring payments and hosting. So if you're not interested in any of that, I won't be offended if you leave right now. Otherwise, I'm going to start. So most of the Drupal people that I know, they wake up in the morning and what really makes them go, what really brought them to the project, what really made them stick to it is they, they have this deep and uh, ferocious desire and need to contribute to the Drupal project. I mean, if you, you feel the energy at DrupalCon, uh, if you saw Dries or Webchick on stage earlier today, and you know the, the energy and enthusiasm they have for the open source community aspect of our project, then it's really easy to understand why people want to contribute. So the, you know, with all the Drupal camps and Drupal cons, the, the deep inner urge that people have that I know is to make this software that we all share and all build better and better and better and participate in that some way. But uh, I've noticed that that gets really hard to do over time. So life happens, business happens, job happens, clients happen, and it's sometimes really hard to contribute. So I know like, at least the way in which I contribute to Drupal has shifted dramatically over the years. I used to write a lot of code, and uh, now I don't. And, uh, when I saw this, this is a chart from Drupal.org. Okay, this is about Git contributions, like contributions of code to Drupal.org over the years. And this is like, you know, phase where it goes up until about um, 2011. I thought this thing could point, but maybe it can't. Uh, where it's steady growth and there's this huge spike when we change to Git and like there's a whole bunch of false positives. And then it still grows until mid-2012 and then kind of tapers off. It's like, hey, that looks just like me contributing code to Drupal.org, only mine's more like boom. Like I totally stopped all at once. And I thought, you know, that's just an, it, that's an, uh, a metaphor for a person growing up in Drupal. You start off, you know, like as a coder and you contribute more and more and you ramp up and you get better and better and maybe you may, you know, make a switch to like a manager or, you know, running a business or marketing a business, uh, designing a product and you, you, like all of a sudden, like it's really hard to find that time to sustain that level of contribution. Don't worry about this graph too much. Part of the reason why it goes down is because GitHub happened, um, and people started shifting their contributions to other places. But it was a nice metaphor for how hard it is to pay for contributing to Drupal. So um, you know, take it from Bart. Open source is good for you. It's good for me. It's good for all of us. And to really embrace that and to keep that Drupal developer happy, the guy who's contributing, um, you really need a way to pay for it. And I, I want to call out Acquia uh, at this point. They were in the room right before. They're probably all gone, so they don't appreciate the moment. But Acquia, uh, if, in case you don't know, employs 
all these people and a couple more full time to contribute to Drupal all the time. That's all they do. Uh, they don't have uh, business ROI, KPI, whatevers. They just sit and they make Drupal core better. And that's awesome. But to do that, um, it's, it's, it's really hard. You have to be able to pay for that. And, and it goes beyond just raising a lot of money from venture capitalists. It actually has a lot to do with your business model. And that's what I'm here to talk to you about, is your business model. But it's not just Drupal. There's a huge precedent in open source for companies making vast contributions to um, open source software. We wouldn't have the Linux kernel either if companies like IBM, Red Hat, Intel, uh, Samsung, Google were not paying for massive contributions of software and time and engineering to open source projects. So what is it uh, that makes you get to be one of these companies? I mean, obviously, we'd all like to be Google, right, uh, or Red Hat. The secret is that you have to build yourself a high margin business so that you can actually afford to contribute to Drupal. And I would like to share one of my visions for you, how you can use commerce, you can use Drupal to build yourself a high margin business so that you can make that Drupal contributor happy and be able to pay for them to have that half day, full day a week to do core, or maybe you can sponsor code sprints, or I mean, there are lots of ways to contribute. It's not just about writing code, but it's also about sponsoring camps, hosting events, uh, having people help out in the issue queue. But all of that, all of that takes time, and time in business equals money. So you really can't afford to sustainably contribute to Drupal unless you build a high-margin uh, business. Um, before we go on, how many of you uh, either work for or own a company that builds sites for other people? Okay, I call you Drupal agencies. How many of you work for or own a company that provides hosting of some sort? Okay. Uh, and then how many of you work for or own a company that builds a product that you sell to customers? Okay, so there's a little bit of overlap there. Good. But the vast, clear majority is the agency crowd. So this is exactly, perfectly, rightly targeted for you. And I'm speaking to the, to the people who go out and get customers, do projects, and then move on. So my vision of the internet, and you can compare this to yours, is that you open your laptop in the morning and money flies out. Okay, I just I, I like that I like that feeling. I like the coffee in the morning, but what I like more is opening the laptop and. <laughs> That's the feeling that I cherish more than anything when I open my laptop. It's just like being bombarded with dollar bills. And um, that, but if you think about it, that's actually what the internet should be doing. You should, you build the internet, right? You build websites for other people. The internet should be earning you money. Uh, if you build sites for people, by the way, your time earns you money. The internet not, isn't earning you anything. It's your hours of labor that are earning you money. And I, I, I like, like the internet to earn me money. So uh, there was a Reddit AMA, so Ask Me Anything. I don't know if you know Reddit. You probably do. In Europe, they've never heard of it. Um, Dries did an AMA and Ask Me Anything on the Drupal subreddit on Reddit. And somebody asked him, if I were to start a Drupal business today, what would be a, an appropriate business model for me to go in? And his answers were fascinating to me. And I've recorded them. And they actually form the outline for um, uh, part of the rest of my presentation. So Dries's business models that he identified were, well, you could start an agency. It's a really easy way to get into business in Drupal, so build sites for people. The gross margins tend to be 20 to 35% for the agencies that uh, survive over time. It's not spectacular margin-wise, but, you know, uh, you can grow it out and scale it up, and eventually it can be fairly lucrative. Uh, you could go into specialized hosting. Dries thinks that there's still a lot of demand. It's worked for Acquia. It's worked for Pantheon. Gross margins tend to be higher, 45 65%. Or if you really want to go where to, to where the gravy is, you'd build a software as a service company. And that's where you start to see margins of 75% or up. And he, in particular, singled out e-commerce and marketing tools as the uh, verticals within SaaS services that he finds rife with possibility. Uh, and I really agree with him. And because his thinking was so close to my own, I, I copied it here and attributed it to him. But that it, it really, it's the way I see it, too. So this is a picture of me talking to a customer. 
especially if I have to build a website for them. I hate that. I never do that anymore. I stopped doing that 10 years ago. This is what I sound like when I'm talking to the customer, but really inside, ah, that's what I feel like anytime that I'm building a website or a piece of software for a customer. And you know why? It's their idea. It's not my idea. It's their baby's dirty diapers, and I'm changing them. Okay? I just... You know, you might love it. You love your jobs, I know. But for me, building websites for other people is very frustrating work. So I always, when I was building the website, I always wanted to find ways to, like, take part of that to be able to use it next time so I could s save myself the pain of going through it again. And eventually I always dreamed of, like, turning that into a sort of a product that I could just sell to people so that I didn't have to actually build the website every time. Because... Again, when I was doing that work, it wasn't that the internet was blowing money in my face when I opened the laptop. It was that I was punching my time card and getting paid by the hour. Uh, whether you do fixed price projects or retainers or uh, no matter how you do your pricing, if you're delivering a project to a person, it's either it's, – it's hourly in the end. You could, you could do a P&L statement that breaks it down by hourly, and it, you can try and do it faster and cheaper on your side, but that's just like raising your hourly rate. And there's a fixed upper limit to how high that can go in terms of gross margin. So let's, that's the agency model. Let's look at the, um, the specialized Drupal hosting model briefly. Um, that's where Dries said the margins were between 45 and 65%. So this model is working out for quite a few companies these days. Acquia Cloud, you know. Pantheon's got a great stand downstairs. Commerce Platform, um, a product that uh, my company is launching. Um, uh, I'm going to give you a demo of that later. And, you know, some others that you – who's heard of Aberdeen Cloud, for example? I'm really curious. Not so many. It's more of a European thing. It comes from Finland. There are probably ten more of these companies. Um, the biggest two are, of course, uh, the top there. But, you know, a lot of people are moved into the specialized hosting. I actually think it's becoming somewhat of a crowded market. So out of Dries's business models, I don't find that the most attractive for a new uh, for a new company, and I know from Commerce Guy's effort that we spent two years and you know, like a million euros building our platform. So um, it's it's not something you can do like from scratch very easily if you're bootstrapping. And I I also think that like the Drupalized specialized hosting Drupal specialized hosting market is going to be more and more threatened by these guys who do generalized hosting really, really well and at such a great scale and with such increasing sophistication and better and better tool sets that it's more and more suitable for anything you want to host. So I, I think that um, the Aqueous Pantheons and Commerce guys are going to have to move very quickly to stay ahead of and differentiated from these guys. So let's focus on the SaaS business model, your Drupal business in the cloud, because that's where Dries said the money is, and that's what's really interesting for commerce and Drupal products. So in case you didn't know what software as a service is, it's when you migrate your applications and um, your um, you outsource everything to the web, and sales and product development is outsourced to the web, and you achieve the state where you can run the entire company with a monkey. That's actually the point of software as a service. But you also need a second money monkey to look at the PowerPoints of the first monkey. So I totally slaughtered the Dilbert jokes. Sorry. You can look up online and laugh on your own time. But what was really important about software as a service is that you have to find a way as a website owner, as a product owner, to take money from people who are visiting your websites. And I've got the feeling, and it's just my suspicion, that most of the websites that Drupal people build don't actually demand payment online. Now, how many of you are building or have built websites that demand payment online? Okay, it's less than half. Um, how many of you run and own a website that demands a payment online in some form? Very few of you, right. That was my suspicion all along. And I think that generalizes beyond this room. I think we're really good at building content websites and marketing websites and some social aspect websites, but we have no clue how to actually get money from the people who visit our websites. <laughs> so that's, that's just, I learned that because I moved to Commerce Guys a couple of years ago and they started teaching me how you do e-commerce. I was never an e-commerce specialist. And it, it's opened my eyes. 
and, but actually, if you want this to happen in the morning when you open up your laptop, you have to demand money from your website, right? You have to have people come to your website and, like, swipe their credit card. How else are they going to pay for what they're taking from you, right? You're giving them a product, a service, something really valuable. How many of you use Salesforce? Salesforce? Really? So few. Okay. Uh, how many of you pay for Spotify? Okay, I'm doing a little better. How many of you pay for any monthly recurring service on the web at all? <laughs> okay, there you go. So you're all familiar with like the value that you get from a website that provides you a monthly service. Uh, why aren't you more familiar with building such websites? So what I learned when I went to Commerce Guys and when we built our own hosting platform and uh, various things is that the actual essence of any product strategy, if you're going to uh, build a software as a service product, you need a recurring usage-based or metered billing strategy. And um, Boyan, you up to talking about it? So I've invited one of my colleagues, uh, Boyan Savanovich, is going to come and take the microphone. And he's going to give you um, what is essentially a preview of his talk tomorrow, which we'll go into depth on this, but it's one of the salient, absolute crucial elements of building a SaaS software product, and it's, uh, yeah, take it away. Okay, great. Let's see what Robert has prepared for us. Yeah, so in the previous year, we, we've been building a framework called Commerce License, and on top of it, a framework for recurring billing called Commerce License Billing, and the idea is to be able to easily attack all of these digital use cases where you're not shipping a physical product, but instead you're charging for some kind of a service either once or multiple times in some kind of a recurring fashion. And the idea of commerce license is to make it easier to charge for multiple kinds of services because by implementing various use cases, we learned that they, many of them, if not most of them, work in a similar way. So take a look at our support offering. It's called a turbo ticket. So you go to our turbo ticket page and you get fields for entering what's bothering you. You have a title and a body and you provide that information directly on the add to cart form and then you enter checkout. And what happens in the background is that we create a, a license object for you and when you complete checkout, when you give us the money, we call a special method on that license object, and that method creates a Zendesk ticket for you, transmitting the information that was attached to the license. So the license had information about your ticket, we created it on Zendesk, and then we showed you the link. And afterwards, we can list your licenses, and we can show you the Zendesk tickets that you have opened. And that's only one of the things where where this works. Look at our various subscriptions to services. So we have a ton of partners. We, we would like to sell you perhaps uh, an account on Exactor or PayPal or uh, American Express and they all work the same way. You check out this product and at the end of checkout we call a special uh, per license type per partner synchronization code that creates this remote account for you and then shows the details of that. And that license can have a specific validity. It could be valid for a month or two or three. It could be a one-time thing or it can be a multiple-time thing. So, and of course, the main value in this is handling some kind of uh, SaaS billing, which is what we do for a commerce platform where you start checkout, you select the zone in which will create your little cloud, and when you finish, when you complete checkout, we create your platform, we attach information about your platform to your license, and based on that license, we continue to bill you every month. And we support many different ways of doing so. We support prepayment, which means you pay up front. We support postpayment, which is kind of like the way your uh, mobile subscription works. You pay for the previous months. We have plans. We have uh, usage that can be attached to a plan, plus an overage fee where you pay for some kind of additional usage, for example, minutes that weren't included in your mobile plan, and many other details. So those are just some of the use cases. So we have charging for a SaaS product. We have charging for support per incident. Or we have handling 
uh, subscriptions or billing for a third party. And we, we, we can go further and further. We can charge for files, uh, build any kind of a service like that, charge for premium content. So anything that's not shippable is handled by this framework. And if you're interested in learning more details about that, we have a session called uh, the Digital Commerce Ecosystem tomorrow at 1 o'clock. So come and see us. Thanks. Thank you, Brian. So there you have it. It's uh, basically a recipe for how to take money from your website visitors for basically anything that you want to sell them, whether it's access to a resource on your website or the ability to do something on your website or a remote resource like the Zendesk ticket example. Um, I think tomorrow you might be showing an example where you're selling access to files on Amazon S3, for example. Um, and so that's one of the fundamental um, fundamental recipes or building blocks for building a, a successful SaaS service. And I'd long gone around the world, basically, talking to Drupal uh, groups about building products and moving out of agency work and achieving higher margins, and I'd seen so little of it happening, and I really had begun to wonder why. And what I realized when I came to Commerce Guys, it, it was because nobody was talking about the payment part. Nobody was talking... Uh, about how to actually get the money from your website visitors, uh, and especially on a recurring monthly basis. So so there are a couple other parts that I realize we're missing, um, and a couple other opportunities that I want to speak about. So how many of you have ever built a Drupal distribution of any kind? Of any kind? How many of you use Drupal distributions like Kickstart, Atrium? What's your favorite one? Panoply? Who uses Panoply? Yeah, really? Only one person uses Panoply? Okay, check out Panoply. Great. Have you tried the um, um, the demo framework distribution from Acquia? DF. Oh, you got to go go home and download the demo framework. How many of you used Kickstart? By the way, wow. Good on you. You've got great taste as an audience. <laughs> okay, so um, I see uh, distributions as being the distilled, concentrated know-how of, uh, of a, a digital agency, basically, or a Drupal agency. How many of you built, have built sites two or three or more times for similar customers? Okay. And do you use... Um, installation profiles or Drush make files to launch any pro any project, like to get you started, to do the part that you do every time? Raise your hand, don't nod your head. <laughs> Thanks. So, okay, good, interesting. So uh, maybe a little background because not as many hands went up as I thought. Um, Drupal has this singular, very unique ability to package itself as a pre-built site that gets you 90 to 100% of the way towards a usable product in a specific vertical out of the box. There are tons of distributions. Open Atrium is groupware and internet and collaboration. Kickstart, of course, is e-commerce. Push tape is for musicians. Drupal Rooms does hotel bookings. Red Hen does content uh, customer relationship management. Drupal Commerce is also an internet collaboration um, solution. Camellio is an e-learning, and it goes on and on and on. I, I, learned of two new distributions that I'd never heard of since I came to DrupalCon already. So a lot of people build distributions, but very few people actually build a business model around their distributions. Uh, there's even a restaurant's distribution, if you, and, and this is actually a great um, example. So imagine for the rest of my talk that we're going to talk about the example where you want to go out and uh, get websites for all your local restaurants. You've noticed that none of their websites either exist or are very good, and you want to use this Drupal distribution as a starting point. So what do you want to do with this? You want people to, for little or no money, um, to be able to sign up and try it out. And then you want to be able to charge them a base monthly price for having the website and maybe a higher price for some more features like integration with uh, menu systems that distribute the menus or an automated online um, reservation manager because there are different types of reservation managers that people like to use. But not every restaurant will be happy with one of your stock themes because they want an individual look, so you're going to have to customize it. Okay, So those are kind of the um, parameters. Two different plans, and you want to be able to customize the theme. 
So here's the, 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 the overall recipe then um, for how you could do that and what that product looks like. So you've got your distribution, your restaurant site, and you've got this commerce licensing that Boyan talked about. That's going to handle the two different types of plans. That's going to uh, handle you know, the, the monthly billing aspect. And then we skipped one part. We didn't talk about how you're going to actually host that site. So the idea here is that you're going to launch an entire site based on a distribution for this restaurant. So that be, has to be hosted someplace. And um, this comes back to one of Dries' business models. I think for that, that the recipe calls for a targeted, uh, Drupal targeted hosting that lets you easily launch sites from, say, a distribution or an install profile at a very low cost. Can totally hide the complexity from the end user, the restaurant in this case, but still allows you to do something like go in and customize the theme. Okay? So there are two solutions to that. Um, aside from finding a company that will sell you good hosting at the right price point. You need your customer-facing site, where they sign up for it, to be able to launch the restaurant site. So the workflow from the customer is, point of view, I'm a restaurant. I go to the website. I say, I want a restaurant site. It launches on your hosting. And then you've got to have somebody, whether it's the cousin of the owner of the restaurant or you as a digital agency or somebody they hire, come in and customize that theme so that it looks like what they want their restaurant to look like. And then the billing has to be there so that you collect your money every month. So th that's the recipe of what it looks like to actually turn a Drupal distribution into a business model. And the uh, software as a service happens in the center where all of those things intersect. Um, cool. This is, I'm going to come back to this, Scott, and we're going to do it uh, towards the end. Is Scott here? Scott Hooker? Yeah, he's back there. Great. Um, skip those two slides. For a moment, yeah, it's uh, he's, Scott provided a case study that actually fits better to the talk I was supposed to give. So we're going to do that at the, at the end um, after we finish the arc of uh, the current conversation. So I've just given you a recipe for um, taking a distribution, using commerce, using a hosting solution to turn it into a business model. And now I want to speak very briefly about how Drupal 8 is going to accelerate that and make it easier for you to achieve that type of business model. There are three ways that I can identify that Drupal 8 is a godsend for the business model that I just specified. The first one is um, CMI, or configuration management. Um, that's handy because if you have different configurations of your product, one that you know has a seating chart, one that has a daily menu, one that has a blog, one that has a Pinterest wall, um, an a image gallery wall, then you want to have a way to deploy these features or these uh, add-ons to your websites. But maybe these are exactly the things that you're putting licenses on. So maybe you charge your uh, restaurants uh, an extra price every month if they have an online seating plan, okay? Like where you can actually pick your table. Or if you can do a custom menu or for catering or whatever. These are add-ons that cost more. And the license billing hands, handles the part of the equation where you actually take money for that. But the CMI, the configuration management in Drupal 8, where it is able to export the configuration for something that you've done into deployable files is going to be great for when you want to actually upsell one of your restaurants to having one of these features. You'll be able to transport these files onto their site, and they'll have that feature without you having to go in and click around and build things. So to me, CMI is going to allow, uh, how many of you use features module in your uh, daily practice? Right. I, I see CMI as being the better features module in the end. It tries to do less, but it will enable us to do more. And that's in, in Drupal 8. Uh, the second area uh, where Drupal 8 is going to really turbocharge the SaaS uh, offering business for you is in the REST APIs that it enables. So an API is when uh, is going to allow like apps and other servers and other websites to talk to your customers' websites and interact with them. So Twitter got really big really fast in part because it was an API-based service. Now, you didn't just go to the website to tweet. You could do it from your phone. 
and it could communicate with your phone. You got your alerts on it on the phone, or you could build a um, integration with Facebook so that any tweet that you uh, tweeted got posted to your Facebook wall, or you could build a desktop application for your desktop com computer to like TweetDeck to do all your tweeting in a in a more uh, you know rich way than the, they could have done in the web browser. So giving Drupal the ability to easily specify REST APIs will give you ways to expose the business value of your sites, of your distributions, to other applications and agents. You can even monetize those. The licenses that you sell and meter and bill for could actually be API calls, for example. Why not? So I see the REST API integration in Drupal 8 as being a great enabler for these software as a service models as well. And finally, and most importantly, Twig. This comes to the, um, the use case where you want to provide a custom theme for your restaurant. Uh, Twig is going to allow you to do some really amazing things, especially if you want to keep your hosting costs down. You're probably going to want to cram a lot of uh, people into like a multi-site or uh, one document route. But if you did that, you'd never let them edit the theme because they could hack all your other customers' sites. Because in Drupal 7, the theme runs in PHP, and that's a powerful enough programming language that you could simply just hack the server. So you could never, on Aquia Gardens, for example, just let people upload or edit the actual theme template files. Twig takes that all out of the equation. Twig makes it safe for your customers to be able to edit the theme files and make the site look like they want to without posing a risk for the running software or a security hazard for the other customers you have on there. So I see Twig as being essential in your distribution-based software as a service model to keeping the costs really low by being able to do a multi-tenant uh, a multi-tenant product. Plus you can define your own widget tags and that would give you like uh, drag and drop uh, features like you know place place your table choosing widget here, um, possibly, maybe. You know, what you see is what you get editor. We'll have to see how that turns out. But Twig's going to be a big one. OK, so I've spoken, if, we, if, if I go back to that Venn diagram, I've spoken a little bit about Drupal distributions being the core distilled essence of your know-how that you're going to sell to the customer. And we've spoken about the commerce license billing, which is your way to actually charge your customers for your software as a service product. I want to speak very briefly now about the Drupal targeted hosting, and I'm going to use Commerce Guy's hosting platform as an example because, hey, this is a sponsor session and we get to do that stuff here. But in reality, you could actually use any uh, hosting service that fulfills a few very important criteria. One that you could launch sites on it using API calls. So you could just say, launch me a site from, you know, somebody's bought a restaurant site, launch me a site. Two, you're going to want to be able to build uh, your site from an a install profile or a Drush make file because you want to maintain your product in one repository but deploy it on the customer's site um, from that repository. So you don't want to have to copy the files over. You want just a Drush Maker profile file. And three, you want to be able to um, give your customer the ability to get into that theme directory and theme file in a very organized way without being able to get into the rest of the code. So there are three pretty tight parameters, and I'm going to show you how um, the Commerce Guys platform um, actually fulfills that. So really briefly, this is the overview of the interface. I'm making a branch of my code. Uh, the way the Commerce Platform works is that you take your master repository, um, and that's an entire running website, and you branch it. And it branches not just the code, but like the entire stack, the PHP, MySQL, the um, Redis, the Solar. And it branches it hierarchically so that I could make like a, a sprint branch, and then underneath that I could make like feature one, feature two, feature three. And each one of those is a full working website with developers committing code to it. So that's what you just saw there. In the next screenshot, I'm, I'm um, going to add some users. So this is where, in my example, I would add my agency themer or my cousin who knows how to do CSS or a, a shop that I've hired to come in to be able to work on my theme as a restaurant. So I'd enable them to come in. Um, you, they can have 
different permissions on every uh, branch that I'm working on, and every branch is an entire website. So I could make um, a feature branch that's like my new theme, give one developer access to that, they go to town making it look good, and then I'm going to merge that back upstream into my live site when it's ready. Um, and that allows you to have the restaurant site that has a, a, you know, a unique look and feel. And finally, for the hardcore uh, command line people out there, I'm just going to show you what it looks like to edit a project make file to add some modules to it. So um, the website, remember, has to grab the install profile of your product and deploy it onto the server. And you need to be able to add some custom features and stuff. And it's very easy to make that kind of product if you can build it all in a make file or project make file. And what I'm doing here in the video is that I'm pushing that make file to the server, and all of a sudden, boom, I've got the Ctools module, which I just added, on, to, on my server. And there it's built the entire environment new. So this is important for the recipe, because this is how you put the theme that the, the themers are working on in your directory, but all of the other software comes from your private repository. Then your restauranteur's cousin can actually safely go in and work on that theme without screwing up your site. So with that kind of recipe, I think you could build the type of product that I was mentioning. And if I were to wrap that all up, I call it hybrid SaaS. And it starts with a specialized distribution. Um, you're building a site per client, not multi-tenant in that particular example. Um, it's built on specialized hosting that supports some of those features like Drush Make, profile files, the separation of the code you want your customer to work on versus the code they're not supposed to touch. Pay for features, pay for usage, like you can pay to have uh, the, the menu booking feature, or you could pay, make your customer pay for how many people book on the website or how many people visit the website. Monetized APIs and a theme layer that you can actually expose to the client. That's my recipe. We're going to have some time for questions left over, I believe. Um, if I look at my clock really quickly, then yes, we're good on time. So now I'm going to invite Scott Hooker up, and he's going to give you one more example from commerce that at this point seems a little um, disjointed, disjunct, but it came from the other session description, which is something that you could be doing with commerce that's not necessarily selling. Okay, something, uh, a use case for commerce that you hadn't necessarily thought of. So you get a little of the other session too. <coughs> Scott Hooker. Hello. Um, so I'm doing a session after this on how you can build a commerce mobile app built on PhoneGap. Um, but what I've done with this site, and it's a bit of a kind of shameless plug, is basically nicked or stolen all of the commerce code to produce a site that doesn't sell anything but still uses the same sort of architecture of uh, a cart and an order. And what this site does, and I'm correct in saying gambling's illegal in Texas? Is that correct? Can you gamble? Nothing's illegal in Texas. Okay. Well, <laughs> okay, cool. So um, in the UK, gambling is totally legal. It's totally fine. And what this site does is tracks uh, soccer bets and lets the user place the bet in the application or on the, on the website. Um, so it's using all of the commerce functionality. So in this instance, the products are the football fixtures. And when you add them to your basket, they become the line items. And here is the website view. So here we have the fixtures that I said are the products. Uh, the basket here is what I call a tracker. And you add them, and they become line items. And then you can save them, and they become orders. And it's quite a use, good use case where you can use commerce without selling anything. It's a really good data structure. So Scott, will you, will you go back all of those commerce terms, the line orders? Yes, yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, fixtures, products, and explain what those are? Like in the commerce sense? Yeah, so in the commerce sense, we uh, products in commerce are the physical items or digital items, as Bourne explained earlier, that you can sell, so be it a T-shirt or a digital product. And in this instance, uh, they're just football fixtures. When you add a product to an order in commerce, they become a line item, and that lets you persist the price um, so if the price of the product changes, the historical order data still remains correct. And then when you check out your cart, uh, in this instance, when you save your tracker, it becomes a, an order, 
and that uh, contains all of the line item data and the references to the customer profiles, which would contain all of your customer order data and any shipping information and such and such. Cool. Cool. Thank you. So that was a great example of um, how you can do cool things with commerce that um, you might not have thought of. So um, that was nice, tacked on at the end a little bit, but you got to see something else. We have plenty of time for questions. We have at least four commerce guys in the room. The question mic is there. So um, if you have a question, um, I, is this being recorded? I think the question mic is mostly so it's being recorded. I don't think this is actually being recorded. So forget the question mic. Is it recording? Okay, then use the question mark, please. Um, let me turn it up in case anybody actually has a question. Can somebody test it for me? Tap it. Yes, sir, and what's your question? <laughs> <laughs> See, I knew. <laughs> Is there any uh, feature that would allow a customer's credit card to be held? and then charge after they've purchased the service, or charge if they do not go through the service, and so that for their charge for cancellation. So um, I'm probably going to have to have Boyan come up and talk about this a bit. But um, yes, this is a very important feature if you want to do something what we call post billing. And we actually do this on our site when you sign up for our hosting platform. So most credit cards have a feature where you can either do an authorization with no uh, value or they have like a convention if you like charge is it one dollar boy on that one dollar that they um don't they don't even ring it through right <laughs> they, 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 just, they, they just use that as like the authorization that they're going to use for a charge that you're going to make later and then they can hold that for a specific amount of time so um what are the payment solutions that we know that do that really well pa we use paymill Stripe and Braintree both both do that as well. In any case, Commerce Card and File is the module that actually has the API and allows you to save the card, meaning the card token, without touching the actual real card information. Right, so the piece of software you're looking for, not at the payment solution level, not like at the Stripe, Braintree, Paymill solution level, but at the Drupal Commerce level, is called Com Commerce Card on File. And it's an integral part of the... Um, usage-based and recurring billing because you don't want your um, customer to have to put their card in every time, right? Like, oh, the month's, <laughs> the month's up. Come and give us your credit card details again. That wouldn't ever work. So you need the card on file, which stores a token from the payment solution and uses that token to authorize a charge at the end of the month. Yes, one of my distribution is in a kind of an appointment service. Mm -hmm. And with appointments, one of the biggest concerns is people making a reservation and then canceling. And right. So I was trying to figure out an easy way through PayPal to set up a system where the card is on reservation. If they go through the service, they don't even have to pay anything on the website. But in the event that they cancel, and essentially uh, leading to a loss for the person who would have booked the appointment otherwise. Right. You could you could with a card on file and maybe maybe with the license billing, you could do something like. Um, you know, you could do the capture when they reserve, and there's a $5 cancellation fee and $50 if they use the service. If you want to hear a lot more about the possibilities, come to Boyan's session that goes deeply into this stack. When is it, Boyan? He's looking it up. Yeah, tomorrow at 1. Tomorrow at 1. Okay. Okay? Thank you. Um, I wanted to mention, uh, now that you remind me, that um, there's some, there are two actually very important and very interesting elements to the recipe that I didn't go deeply into. One is that you have to be able to send your customers invoices, um, and that fills out that part. And we use something called Commerce Billy, B-I-L-L-Y. And you also have to be able to chase people down when their cards don't work. That's called delinquent user notification, uh, or D-U-N. And that's why, as a, as a term, it's called Dunning, Dunning Management. So there's a, a Commerce Dunning module that will send out all of the notifications saying, excuse me, sir, your card didn't go through. Can you check the details? We're going to try again in a week, and then we're going to cut your service off. And however, however you want to configure it. It's uh, very configurable, and it fits all of the different workflow stages of you know, soft declines versus hard declines, you know, like 
I lost my card, so they gave me a new one with a different number. Therefore, my service stopped working. That's a hard decline. A soft decline is I was over for the month, but I've paid my bills, so it should work now. So um, Commerce Dunning and Commerce Billy, two important uh, bits of the recipe. Other questions? Hey, can you talk about the development plan and the timeline for Commerce uh, for Drupal 8? No. <laughs> do I look like Dries? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, what, what specifically do you want to know? I, I mean, I, I was wondering when will you guys start develop for Drupal 8? Oh, you mean commerce? Yeah, commerce. Yeah. Okay. So um, we've kind of waited until there was a really stable API and maybe some, um, I thought you meant Drupal 8. Now I hear it, commerce 8. Um, commerce 2.0 is what we're calling it. Um, we've waited until there's a stable API in Drupal 8 because we're really dependent on Drupal 8. So we've decided that Commerce 2.0 is going to be Drupal 8 specific. And we've been collecting all of the lessons learned from Drupal Commerce. And we've got an amazing amount of um, literature and research and planning gone into what we want Commerce 2.0 to be. Um, and we're actually in July having our kickoff sprint in Paris with all of uh, our internal leadership and tech leadership to lay the foundation for Commerce 2.0. Um, we're not going to make any guarantees about when anything's available, but Drupal 8 isn't going to be available tomorrow either, so we feel like we've waited the right amount of time to start so that the APIs are no longer shifting un underneath of us. Did that, did that answer your question enough? Yes. It's 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 very nebulous, but we we definitely yeah. That's when it, then that's when it all gets going. Yes, sir. Is there a use case where um, you would actually change the price of the service being offered or the product being offered based on demographic information? So not necessarily a promotional. On which of, kind of information? Dem demographic. Or demographic or, or like target it. So right. you, you yes. know the user, then you change the price based on that. But not necessarily promotional type of, of in, in, adjustments. In, in, in Germany, um, they have a haircut called the Kranz, and that's for if you're bald like this, they only charge you five bucks instead of ten. So that would be kind of like a demographic-based pricing alteration. And yes, no problem. I mean, that's rules-based. That's something that you could do with just the rules, basic rules integration. Uh, in commerce, in Drupal Commerce, all of the pricing happens, um, it goes through a, a pipeline of rules that you can set up. So you can say, if you're um, in Texas, charge them twice as much. No problem. Um, did you have a particularly difficult use case? We're just trying to evaluate Drupal. We're in the beginning stages. And okay. It's probably the most powerful pricing rules engine available for any open source e-commerce package. It's, it's very powerful. You can literally do anything. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. Step forward to the mic and record your voice for posterity. Can you speak a little bit more to the multi-tenant capabilities on platform? You had at one point you talked about it, how you would adjust it for multi-tenant so they could adjust their own themes, and then at the end you said something about that wasn't for right, multi-tenant. Right. So I'd like sure. clarification. Yeah, I, that was confusing. Yeah. So let me let me just um, tell you how Drupal Gardens. Who's oh. familiar with Drupal Gardens from Acquia? Good. Drupal Gardens runs on what's called uh, Drupal multi-site. That means one code base, many databases, okay? So um, you've got different URLs coming in, and based on the host name, uh, Drupal knows which database to use to get the data and the permissions and the content and all of that. So it looks like many, many different sites, and it is many different sites, but if, if I change one character of code in the files, on the file system, it affects all of the sites, okay? And they're all physically on the same hard drive right next to each other which means that if I were going to give one of those, let's say, 100 customers access to the theme files in Drupal 7, they would essentially be executing PHP code on a server that has 99 other customers on it, which can't happen, um, unless you're really clever with Linux permission. 
but probably it's no it just it just can't happen so um, the opposite end of that is to launch an entire different code base and database for every one of your customers and that's um, that doesn't intersect necessarily with commerce platform in any way okay. okay I was just pointing out that my business example my recipe assumes that you're launching one site for every customer and that they're separate sites Okay. okay. They can still build off of one another and off of a master code, or is that so, right? So the blueprint for the site comes from something called an install profile or a distribution, and you launch that using a DrushMake or a dot profile file, and that's why I said you need a hosting company that can actually launch a site from a, a Drush file or a, a project file, so that you've got this distribution that you're controlling, that's the blueprint for your site, that upgrades everybody's site remotely, because if you change a feature there, it's like a new release, and they all get the new release. Plus, you need the local ability to work on something like the theme or maybe a custom module, because that's actually Drupal's selling you know, unique selling uh, value is that it's so customizable. So why would you make a Drupal product that you can't customize? So I, I hope that cleared it up a little. It was a little confusing in my presentation. I right. Okay. Thanks. Anybody else? Got four commerce guys in the room. Three of them smarter than me. <laughs> All right. Well, then thank you for coming. Sorry, I switched the topic of the talk. Thanks for staying anyway, and I hope you liked it. Because I, I switched the levels there because there was nobody in here and we were getting feedback. Like, I'd, I'd speak here and it'd go. <laughs>